This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. RCMP believe they've put a stop to a string of bank robberies that have been happening in southern Manitoba. The robberies occurred in four communities spanning three rural municipalities starting back in November. The CBC's Josh Crabb is standing by live in the newsroom tonight with the details. So Josh, what do we know about these robberies? The RCMP says tellers were passed a note demanding money. At times, the suspect indicated they had a gun. Police say the robber concealed their identity and used different vehicles, but revealed this afternoon they have made an arrest in the case. The first attempted robbery occurred November 10th in Steinbach. The suspect left with no money, but between November 14th and January 3rd, investigators say banks in Low Farm, Glenboro and Miami were robbed and thousands of dollars was stolen. Investigators used video surveillance to identify a suspect. RCMP searched two homes, one in the arm of Hanover and another in the city of Morden, and arrested a 30-year-old Morden man January 9th on five counts of robbery. Officers recovered some, but not all of the cash. After the robbery, the fifth one, on January 3rd, a license plate number was obtained by a member of the public and provided to our officers. While the vehicle did not belong to the suspect, it helped investigators to narrow down and eventually identify a person of interest. Officers say the investigation into the robberies is ongoing to see if anyone else was involved. Josh, that's not all the RCMP was talking about today. Investigators also announced an arrest in a kidnapping. Tell us about that. That's right, Janet. An abduction that occurred back in June 2019. It took a few years before RCMP say there was finally a break in the case. Police say a fingerprint from a stolen vehicle connected to the June 2019 kidnapping helped them identify a witness and then a suspect. Officers say a 16-year-old girl was walking her dog near Landmark when a driver with a knife forced her into his truck. She was hurt and managed to escape the vehicle as it approached a dead end about four kilometers east of Landmark. The suspect wasn't located at the time. A 24-year-old Steinbach man was arrested and charged January 10th. Police say the fingerprint was key to the investigation. That fingerprint, like I said, was actually a witness. So that leads to a witness, that leads to, to other people. And there was a, um, numerous uh, techniques and investigative statements and things we had to do to get to where the, who the suspect was. The man was charged with several offences, including kidnapping, assault with a weapon and theft-related charges. He was taken into custody. Janet. Thank you for this. That's the CBC's Josh Crabb reporting live tonight. The city's finance committee has asked for a full report detailing the cost of a blockade at the Brady Road landfill south of Winnipeg. The landfill was closed while protesters blocked access to it. The CBC's Alana Cole reports. It was last month that access to the Brady Road landfill south of Winnipeg was first blocked by protesters. They were there calling for a search for human remains. The camp setting up just weeks after police revealed that one man, Jeremy Skibicki, had been charged with first degree murder of four Indigenous women. Remains of one woman, Rebecca Contois, had been found at the landfill. Police believed two other women, Mercedes Myron and Morgan Harris, were in the Prairie Green landfill, and the protesters said other missing people could have ended up in landfills. The Brady Road facility did reopen to the public last week. Today, the City Finance Committee approved up to $411,000 to cover the tipping fee cost of diverting waste to other landfills during a period of about two weeks in December while it was closed. The Finance Committee is now asking for a report looking at the total cost of the closure. Brian Mays chairs City Council's Water and Waste Committee. We were losing revenue and, and this cost, the paying to dump at other uh, sites. So uh, I don't know what the total will be. I would think under a million given what we've got for December, but obviously there was a period of blockage in uh, in January as well. During today's meeting, Councillor Janice Luke suggested she'd like to see other levels of government contribute to the cost. We did hear from Cambria Harris, the daughter of Morgan Harris, last week. She told CBC her family was unhappy with the city's decision to resume operations at the Brady site. 
As of right now, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs says a committee is still pursuing two separate feasibility studies to search both the Brady Road landfill and the Prairie Green landfill. Alana Cole, CBC News, Winnipeg. New statistics show some Manitoba surgical departments don't have enough nurses to run at full capacity. By September of last year, Grace Hospital had nearly 20% of its nursing positions vacant. St. Boniface Hospital had a vacancy rate of almost 15%. NDP leader Wab Kanu says the province should focus on building capacity. We know that we're not going to improve health care in this province by sending our resources to the United States of America. Instead, we need to have a concerted, concrete plan to invest in good nursing jobs right here in this province so that you can get the care that you need. The province says sending some Manitobans out of province for surgeries is only a temporary option until the situation here improves. It's been almost 10 years since the old Winnipeg Stadium was torn down. That big chunk of land in the Polo Park area, one of the city's busiest shopping districts, has been sitting there undeveloped ever since. A plan to build residential towers there has faced roadblock after roadblock. But as CBC's Cameron McLean reports, this time it might just go ahead. Parking lots and empty space where a football stadium once stood. That's what the area around Polo Park looks like right now. But in a few years, it could look like this. Apartment towers with thousands of units, as well as commercial space. This would be kind of almost the same perspective. It's, it's that public area. This is the vision of real estate developer Shindico and Cadillac Fairview, the company that owns the mall. It'll have to be everything from bachelors to three bedrooms to, to a mixture of sizes and balconies and uh, different price points because really you're going to have to have a mixture of people living there. You can't just say we're only going to have luxury apartments. If the plan goes ahead, commercial buildings at the south end of the mall would be demolished and parking lots would be replaced with apartment towers six to 12 stories high. Multi-level parkades would still provide the same amount of parking space, plus more for the new residents. In total, Shindico says it's planning to build about 4,000 apartments. It's a plan many city officials have hoped to see. What this means is this means investment in Winnipeg, which is really critical as well. This, is, this will help our, these kind of investments help our local economy. They create jobs. They provide housing, which is needed for, for, um, you know, for, for our community. And these are the kind of developments I, you know, I would like to see all across our city. Plans to build a residential development at Polo Park have faced obstacles in the past. Regulations prevented construction around the airport due to noise concerns. In recent years, the city and province have changed those rules, clearing the way for development to go ahead. The plan could still face more hurdles as it goes to City Hall for approval. It's not formally in front of me yet, uh, but certainly I've been waiting for this day. I think Winnipeggers have too, and uh, we need more housing. Winnipeggers know that, uh, but that walkability to an amenity, uh, I think that there's a lot to get excited about here. Shindigo hopes to begin construction next year, with residents moving in as early as 2026. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, CBC News did reach out to the Winnipeg Airports Authority for comment about the proposed development. In the past, it's worried that if there were residential developments there, people would complain about airport noise. A spokesperson declined to comment today, saying the new plans have not been shared with the authority. Police are asking for your help finding a missing woman. 39-year-old Gabrielle Marsden hasn't been seen since early December. At that time, she was in the Dufferin area, Selkirk Street area. Marsden's about 5 foot 3, she has a thin build. Police are concerned for her well-being. If you have any information that could help find her, you're asked to call the missing persons unit or Crime Stoppers. A second Alberta man has been charged with attempting to intimidate a Manitoba judge. 45-year-old Randall J. Cameron was arrested by Calgary police yesterday on a Canada-wide warrant. He is a lawyer at the Alberta-based Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedom. Earlier this month, John Carpe, also a lawyer at the same centre, was arrested and charged with intimidation and attempting to obstruct justice. The charges stem from information that came to light in July of 2021 
which said a, a private investigator had been hired to follow Manitoba's Chief Justice, Glenn Joyal. At the time, Joyal said it was an attempt to catch him breaking COVID-19 protocols while he was presiding over a court challenge involving pandemic restrictions. Both men have been released and police do not anticipate any additional arrests. Winnipeg police have released their holiday check stop numbers for this past Christmas season. Numbers are very similar to the 2021 holiday season. Last December in 2022, police stopped more than 2,900 vehicles. 75 of those drivers were found to be under the influence of either alcohol or drugs. 28 drivers were charged with criminal impairment. Police say one third of those charged were involved in car crashes. There was one fatality. A dog once deemed by the city's animal services agency to be one of Winnipeg's most unwanted canines was adopted over the weekend. The two-year-old bull mastiff mix named Hank had been at the city's facility for the past six months. But now pa Hank's new owner is over the moon about his new best friend. Good boy. Oh, good boy. We've had Hank boy. for over six months at Animal Services and he's it's just been difficult um, having him get adopted. And so very recently our team came up with an idea of um, featuring Winnipeg's most unwanted dogs. We have a handful of dogs that just aren't perfect dogs. They need a uh, experienced pet owner, so they sit for longer. The ones that have no problems, that are the, the happy-go-lucky dogs that like everything, get adopted very quickly. Um, but we like to work on the dogs that aren't so perfect. So our team of staff and volunteers have been working with Hank for months and months and months, um, and um, trying to have a positive outcome for the dog, which is what we have here. Hi, I'm Dylan, I adopted Hank. Uh, just this past Saturday and he's amazing. <laughs> How did you hear about Hank? Uh, I saw Hank on Instagram actually um, and uh, I fell in love immediately. I've always loved Mastiffs and he's beautiful so I wanted to go check him out and see how he was. <laughs> oh, I love him. No dog is perfect but he's damn near perfect so um, yeah I was a little bit nervous but after I got to know him um, and even since Saturday, you know, having him in my house every day, uh, he's a sweetheart. Leave it to the wonderful Fiona Odlum to note <laughs> that Hank and his new owner kind of have the same hair color. They do. They kind of look good together, yeah, don't they? They, they are a total match. It's How perfect. adorable. <laughs> I love it. Perfect dog walking weather tonight. There you go. So Hank is in <laughs> for some good walks. He's in for a great walk. Got a little bit of snow. Let's take a look at our current conditions right now. We're in Winnipeg. We do have a little bit of light flurry activity. Minus 11. No wind chill really to speak of. The wind is incredible incredibly calm so we don't have that as an issue either so uh, we have a pretty great night here we have fog again on the horizon for us we're going to see that developing really from the southern border all the way up to past Thompson we don't have uh, a lot of snow on our radar you can see just a couple little white uh blips there and that is that snow that is drifting through and this is really widespread not just isolated to the Winnipeg area. I do want to show you something that I'm worried about. It's this little bit of pink right here. So this is going to be tomorrow afternoon heading towards Winnipeg. We could see that pink that's freezing rain and that is going to be causing an issue that's right along the Trans Canada Highway there so if you're going to be heading out for the weekend do note that that could be a little bit icy for you it does intensify as we look towards the weekend I'm hiding the worst in Saskatchewan here it comes we're going to watch for that low to pass through and we do have that little bit of freezing rain here but watch this that blue that's actual rain. This is not springtime. This is January. It does cool down. It is colder in Manitoba. So we should see a mixed precipitation and not quite rain. It doesn't accumulate to anything here on our radar in the next 24 hours. Yesterday, we got 0.8 of a centimeter of snow in the Winnipeg region. Okay, in terms of tonight, around midnight, we're going to be looking at minus 11 degrees under a partly cloudy sky. Now, I know some folks have actually been getting some beautiful shots of Aurora up in the northern portions of the province. I'd love to see those. 
fog developing again. That'll be an issue tomorrow. Minus 11 first thing in the morning. We could even see a little bit of sunshine trying to peek through in towards Winnipeg. Mostly cloudy though by the time we get towards lunchtime. Note that wind, south 30 gusting 45. So all that snow that we've been seeing, all that little bit of snow that we have tonight, that's going to blow up and make it difficult in those open exposed areas. So, you know, when you're around McGilvery and Wilkes in that area, you could see a reduced visibility. All right. So for the next couple of days, a big warming trend getting to minus two by Sunday. We're going to chat tomorrow about that precipitation and see how that's going to be changing. And Janet, look at this. That's the sun. Do you remember what that looks like? I do, vaguely, <laughs> yes. Large yellow thing. That, uh, yeah, it's been missing 12 days now. No one's counting. I'm counting. I'm, I'm counting. counting too. <laughs> but I'm counting for a good reason. <laughs> do you like it like this? I, I do, because it's not brutally cold. It's true. I'll take that. You're right. I know. But you need, <laughs> we also need a good freeze up of our ice, right? Yes, we absolutely do. So we don't want do. it too, too warm. <laughs> Fiona Odlum, thank you very much. Check back with, in with you in just a few minutes. Okay. Young athletes could take the first step to making their Olympic dreams come true a week from Saturday. That's when the University of Winnipeg will host an event to let them test their strength, power and speed. Now, few people know speed like Team Canada's bobsleigh pilot Eden Wilson, who just happens to have Manitoba roots. I spoke with her this afternoon. Eden Wilson, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. What's it like to pilot a bobsleigh? It is very fast. It all flies past you. Um, the speed of a four man, um, which I drive the mono bobs and the two man, the speed of a four man is 157 kilometers. So a lot faster than I would drive on the highway. <laughs> so uh, it's very fast. It's a lot of adrenaline all at once. Amazing, I cannot imagine. What a, what a journey you've had. You're an RBC Olympian, which helps you pay some of the bills. It's very expensive to train. Uh, that's wonderful. And you're here to tell us how you're trying to get more Indigenous athletes noticed. Yes, so there's an amazing um, event happening. RBC Training Ground is going to kick off in Winnipeg. It's their eighth year. Um, it's going to happen at the University of Winnipeg on January 21st. And it's kind of step one to getting involved with a national sport organization and on your own road to the Olympics. So what happens when you go to a, a, a training ground event? Yeah, so at Training Ground, it is open to anyone ages 14 to 25. And then there are a couple of events. There's a vertical jump. There's a max strength test, there's an endurance piece, and then there's a speed um, 60 meter or 30 meter sprint. Wow, so if you do well in those, you might just get noticed and, uh, yeah. and have some opportunities, yes? Yeah, so you would get noticed, you could get invited to, there's a national final every year, and sport has so many opportunities for athletes that, that a lot of people don't really think of. There's scholarship, mentorship, sponsorship opportunities, as well as just a ton of well-rounded skill development that you get from being a national team athlete. I know you and Bridget Laquette, another great Manitoban athlete we're very proud of, uh, are working particularly interested in getting more Indigenous athletes on, on the path. Um, Tell us how you're working with the North American Indigenous Games. Yes, so this year, Training Ground has these incredible opportunities, as you said, hosted with the North American Indigenous Games with the provincial delegations um, on their way to preparing for that July Halifax event, which is very exciting. So essentially, it's going to be the same type of combine. It's the same um, event. You're ranked amongst everybody in the country. Um, but it's just a little bit more accessible, which I think is um, a key piece in getting more Indigenous participation at high-level sports. As a Jamaican Canadian, as, as a Métis woman as well, like, have you felt barriers because of your race? Absolutely. Like, I didn't grow up wanting to be an Olympian. I didn't see anybody who kind of looked like me in those roles. So joining the national team was not something that I had expected to do. And I didn't do it until I was um, older, until I was in my early 20s. Um, so the idea that there's more representation in the sport, so um, more Indigenous youth can find their path into something that for me is so exciting and so great, like sport, is uh, really near and dear to my heart. When's your next bobsleigh event? 
we have World Cups running every weekend, and then I will be competing at the end of January, hopefully in um, Winterberg. Wow. Well, we hope you yeah. do incredibly well. It'll be exciting to have you here in Winnipeg for the University of Winnipeg Training Ground event on January 21st. Next Saturday, a week from a couple of days from now. Yes, very exciting. Are you going to get to spend any time in the province? Yes, I'll be there hopefully the day before. Um, I was born in Brandon, so Manitoba is very important to me. Um, so hopefully I'll get to spend a couple of days in Winnipeg. Well, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll give you great weather while you're here. All the best, Eden. Thank Fingers you so crossed. much. For, Thank you. Thank thanks you. for the time. Bye-bye. Bye. A week and a couple of days from now. You like the way I tell time? Still ahead, airlines. They were apologizing again today for what they called unacceptable service over the holiday season. We have more on how customers react to that apology after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Several airlines apologized today for what they called unacceptable service during the holiday season. Officials from Air Canada, Sunwing and WestJet all testified at a committee that was called during the parliamentary break. The airline said bad weather started the problems and that had a cascading effect. They promised change. But as CBC's Ashley Burke reports, customers say today's testimony is not enough. In December, Sunwing passengers were stranded for days in Mexico, fed up to learn that just before midnight, their flight was cancelled yet again. It's just one of the chaotic scenes from this holiday travel season that airlines today had to answer for. The bottom line is, we know we could have done better. Sunwing, Air Canada and WestJet all questioned by MPs about how they could have gotten it so wrong. When is it? ever acceptable that we have passengers uh, sitting on aircraft uh, for for up to 12 hours or, and in some circumstances over 12 hours. That was unacceptable in many, many levels. The airlines blame bad weather and address complaints they kept people in the dark. Our guest communication was lacking, so we're going to do a better job of that. In total, WestJet said it cancelled 1,600 flights over the holidays. Sunwing cancelled 67, including suspending all service from Saskatchewan. How did you possibly book travel uh, for Canadians when you did not have crews or planes lined up to service them? This is a, a catastrophic failure. Uh, in the midst of the storm, with the inability to position, with the inability to recover from the various locations, uh, duty day limitations, uh, we failed to deliver to the level we had expected to. That response not enough for some travelers who say they felt abandoned. No, it's certainly not enough. Um, de being demoralized and not answered to and actually uh, verbally assaulted and, and communication breakdown completely to the point where it was impossible to get a hold of anybody, that's completely unacceptable for any business. The Minister of Transport also questioned by the opposition about why he isn't doing more to protect passengers' rights, including compensation. The air passenger protection regime that you've created has massive loopholes in it. You could fly a 747 through these things and we see airlines uh, clearly exploiting those loopholes in order to avoid paying passengers the compensation that they're due. The regime is quite strong. I know you've had pa uh, experts tell you that it was stronger, much stronger than the U.S. regime. Sunwing confirms it's now dealing with 7,000 complaints tied to the holiday travel, and that includes requests for compensation or refunds after some people say they had to pay out of pocket to find their own way home. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, CBC checked in with travelers at Winnipeg's airport yesterday just to see if travel really has gotten back to normal. We wanted to know what their experiences have been like flying. While there were no major delays here, some folks did tell us they had hiccups along their journey. Over two hours, I've been sitting waiting for their supposed... It was a 425 flight, and I guess it's cancelled, but they were supposed to be there, you know, usually an hour before the flight anyways, right? Yes, so now I'm waiting. In this connection, we have seven suitcases. Even we net get, not getting any single one. Not one of them? No one of them. Everything was fine. I'm coming from Dubai, then Zurich, then Toronto, then Winnipeg, so it was a long flight. So uh, we had some challenges with our luggage okay. en route. Um, so far, it looks like our bags have arrived, so we're pretty excited about that. How was your ride today? Good, good, yeah, good. Good, no yeah. issues. No issue at all. So we have like a lot of luggage and we were scared about the luggage as well, but it, it was on time, so that was fine, yeah. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida was in Ottawa today holding talks with Justin Trudeau and several cabinet ministers. At the conclusion, Trudeau announced an upcoming trade mission to Japan. The goals are to expand trade, strengthen our supply chains and build a sustainable future. These are key elements of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. That new strategy focuses on closer ties with countries that are not in China's orbit. Energy security and the Ukraine war were also discussed. The visit comes with Japan aiming to reduce its energy dependence on both China and on Russia. 
after a radar search of the grounds at a former residential school site in Labrette, northeast of Regina, turned up 2,000 areas of interest. Star Blanket Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, officials there say core sampling will be done to run DNA tests. Then work can be done to confirm which of those hits might just be unmarked graves. CBC's Adam Hunter brings us more. Our hearts are heavy today. This has been a very emotional journey for all of us. In November 2021, the Star Blanket Cree Nation began ground penetrating radar search at the site of the former Labrette Indian Industrial School, about 75 kilometers northeast of Regina. Last fall, one team member made a disturbing discovery. It is a jawbone fragment of a child between the ages of four and six. Uh, the bone fragment has been aged to be about 125 years old which puts us in the first school era. So that brings us back to about 1898. The remains of the child were in a teal box in front of Star Blanket Chief Michael Starr. This discovery has changed everything. It's changed the things that we're going to do. It's changed our mindset. It's changed our, our way of life in a way. The first phase of the search returned 2,000 anomalies, but an anomaly is not considered an unmarked grave site. It could be something else in the ground. This site and many other sites are crime scenes. Those are crime scenes that must be addressed immediately. The news conference took place in the school's gymnasium, the only building left from the former school, which closed in 1998, making it one of the last residential schools to do so in the province. The original school was built in 1884. It burned down in 1904. A second school burned in 1932. We were taken away from our parents, but we learned how to survive. We learned how to forgive. They tried to take our spirits away. They tried to take the Indian out of us. But thank the Creator, we're back here. Strong as we'll ever be. Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations Chief Bobby Cameron is calling on the federal government to build healing centers in communities where there were residential schools. As for the search, the team says it will now start conducting core sampling to run DNA tests to determine if any of the anomalies are graves. Adam Hunter, CBC News on the Star Blanket Cree Nation. Human Rights Watch has leveled criticism at Canada. The New York-based group's annual report says more than 20 First Nations remain under water advisories. It also says First Nations in general are not receiving adequate support to adapt to climate change. Now, the focus of the UN Human Rights Watch report, however, was authoritarian governments. The CBC's Abby Kuavasan reports. Authoritarianism is rising. Even in the countries that claim to be democracies, we have seen a frontal assault on human rights. A sea of suffering, Human Rights Watch's latest report says that's one major consequence of unchecked authoritarian regimes. The NGO suggests a tougher global response to Vladimir Putin's annexation of Crimea in 2014 or his military intervention in Syria may have made the Russian president think twice about launching a wider scale invasion of Ukraine last year. And so the real, really key lesson for us now is to say, the international community can no longer sit by and say we can take our time or we can look over certain situations. It praises the international response to the war but shines a light on Europe's double standards. While EU countries have taken in about 4 million Ukrainian refugees, they have not been as welcoming to others, including Syrians, Palestinians, Afghans and Somalis. The NGO also hails people standing up for their rights in the face of brutal state violence. It's about individuals as well around the world who are moving and standing up. Whether it's in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, they're saying we're no longer willing to accept this and we'll actually risk everything. 
The watchdog says China has long sought silence on its human rights record in exchange for foreign investment, but that silence is becoming more difficult to buy. But I think what we have seen at the international level is actually this growing coalition of governments that are now willing to speak up um, about the lack of accountability for abuses in Xinjiang. The NGO also accuses some world leaders of trading human rights for short-term political gains. U.S. President Joe Biden pledged to make Saudi Arabia a pariah state, but was criticized for greeting the country's crown prince with a fist bump. Canada doesn't escape scrutiny. The report questions how one of the world's most water-rich countries is unable to provide clean and safe drinking water for its indigenous communities even years after the government promised to end advisories. Abby Kualas in CBC News, London. In an open show of defiance, hundreds of Russian doctors are demanding urgent medical care for a prominent critic of the Kremlin. Alexei Navalny has been repeatedly jailed for challenging Russian President Vladimir Putin. He is currently serving a lengthy sentence, which was imposed last March, and his wife says he's seriously ill. Briar Stewart has this report. Dr. Alexander Vanyukov and his family left Russia because of the war. But for months, he's been watching as his country's highest profile political prisoner turns up to court increasingly gaunt and frail. So he looks skinny with a black shadow under eyes and uh, nobody could be healthier with this condition. Alexei Navalny is frequently in solitary confinement. After his lawyer reported that he had a temperature and was being denied medicine, Venyakov and other doctors felt they needed to write an open letter. Maybe it could uh, save Navalny's love, life. Maybe not, but we're just trying. They called on Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, for an end to the abuse of Alexei Navalny, demanding that he be seen by civilian doctors. The letter was signed by more than 600 doctors, most of whom are still in Russia and putting themselves and their careers at risk. Many uh, uh, people um, uh, are afraid. Uh, Dr. Alexander Polupin says some of his colleagues were too fearful uh, to add their names. Uh, the more people uh, sign, the uh, less is uh, personal risk for each of us because uh, they cannot uh, fire all doctors in Russia. <laughs> Palupin was one of the doctors who helped to treat Navalny back in 2020 when he was poisoned with a nerve agent and eventually transported to Germany for medical care. After returning to Russia, he was sentenced to years in prison for contempt of court and fraud. Today, his anti-corruption foundation released an audio tape from court. Where he asks the judge why is it that every time getting even the most basic medication turns into an epic quest. Navalny's lawyer believes the doctor's letter helped because his client is now receiving antibiotics. All of his court appearances have been postponed for the rest of the week. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Fierce fighting is continuing on the ground in Ukraine as troops battle for control of the strategic town of Solidar on the Eastern Front. This video from Ukraine's military shows U Ukrainian troops firing on Russian forces attempting to advance through the area. Ukraine says it's holding ground despite heavy fighting and battlefields littered with bodies. It also says more than 100 Russian troops have been killed in just the last 24 hours. Russia's mercenary forces fighting in the area declared victory yesterday, but Ukraine denies those claims. Still ahead, we'll hear how local organizations are coming together to teach people how to mend their clothing, clothing instead of sending it to the landfill. And Fiona Odlum will join us with a look at the Manitoba forecast, so stay with us. Lots still to come. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
When's the last time you darned a sock or replaced a broken zipper? More than 10 tons of clothing gets tossed now every year in North America, and much of that stuff could have been mended and worn again. The Pembina Fiber Shed, a nonprofit that promotes the textile industry here in Manitoba, plans to sew up that knowledge gap this coming Saturday with a community mending day. I spoke with an organizer this afternoon. Anna Hunter, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So what is Community Mending Day? Well, it's an opportunity for community to come together and talk about the challenges with fast fashion and textile waste, and at the same time, learn some really valuable skills to repair our clothing to extend the life of them. Are you gonna teach people how to sew? You know, we're going to teach people some sewing skills, either with a machine or by hand, uh, in the context of small repairs. So people aren't going to walk away knowing how to make their own clothes. They're going to know how to repair their own clothes. So a rip in your favorite jeans or maybe a hole in some special socks or how to sew a button on, those sorts of skills. You actually want people to bring stuff that needs mending. Yes, that is exactly the point. We want people to bring a pile of their mending. We will have all the tools, so uh, needles and scissors and thread and um, darning mushrooms and sewing machines, and you just bring your mending, and we will have a mending help desk, so some trained professionals who can show you how to do those repairs, as well as a community mending circle, so a chance for community to sit together to talk about what clothing means to us, to talk about... Uh, the 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 textile waste that we're experiencing and how to extend the life of our clothes why do you think people should learn how to mend their clothing uh well i think i believe that it's important for two reasons the first one is uh we're seeing a, a ridiculous amount of textiles ending up in our landfills about 81 pounds a year uh, the average Canadian throws out, and we really want to limit that. The second reason is we really need to um, look at the clothing supply chain and to build in those skills and the capacity to create some more clothing security. And if anything, in the last two years, we've really seen the fragility of our supply chains and clothing is essential. So let's learn to, to fix our clothing, extend the life of them, and keep more trash out of the landfills. So if someone's watching and they'd like to take part in Community Mending Day, what do they do? So the event is happening this Saturday, January 14th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Norbury Glenley Community Centre. It is a sliding scale donation based event, so no one will be turned away, but we'll definitely encourage some uh, donations for the, for the day and the training. And we really hope lots of folks will come out for the day. It's come and go, so no one has to commit a lot of time. They can come and do a repair and leave or come and do a repair and sit around and chat for the rest of the afternoon. Anna Hunter, thank you so much for telling us about this today. Thanks for having me. Fiona Odlum joins us once again with a beautiful viewer photo. Absolutely amazing. This, our province is so stunning and this picture is showcasing someone who was voted the best roadside attraction in Manitoba. Eric Gunderson sent us this picture of Josiah Flintabaddy Flonitin. Am I saying that wrong? I think I am. Flinty, there he is. <laughs> Let me do the pose. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much for sending this in. I love it. What a great view he's got too, those rolling hills. Uh, you know, I'm always looking for those viewer photos. Right now we're sitting at 11 degrees here at the Forks, minus 17 in Steinbach, minus 10 in Eli, minus 16 in Swan River, minus 12 all the way over in towards the Kenora region. A little cooler the further north we go. Look at that big jump from Gillum to Churchill, minus 26 to Churchill. I am happy you guys are, are back into that cold snap there. That's what we like to see. What we're going to be looking for now is some snow. Now, there's this big low pressure system that's going to be sliding across here. We're looking for some good snow to come through here, up to about six, seven centimeters towards Churchill possibly a little bit more towards Tadouli Lake, but the rest is just going to be light snowfall, not really registering to, to a whole lot, but it is going to still be a concern, and that's because we're going to see the fog as an issue again. 
We're gonna be watching for those numbers fluctuating. And with, so we're gonna have the reduced visibility with the fog. But here is our other problem. We're gonna be watching for a nice shift in our wind pattern. Overnight tonight, we're gonna start seeing some gusts coming through that are really gonna be a little bit stronger. We're looking for gusts into the 40s and 50s. So all that loose snow is gonna start making it difficult in those open exposed areas and visibility is already reduced with the fog. So caution tonight. Chance of flurries in towards Kenora and Red Lake and the Dryden area, just light, light snow coming to you. Fog, wind, and light snow towards Winnipeg and the surrounding area. As we look towards Brandon and Dauphin, very similar, but definitely cooler as we move in that western direction. Minus 18 in Brandon. To the north, we're looking for the snow in Churchill and in towards Gillum, a light chance of snow and fog along the Saskatchewan border. Tomorrow, we still see more snow in Churchill. A chance of morning flurries as we move further south. And then we're going to see this chance of flurries really throughout the south. But fog is mostly going to be our concern in the morning. We're in a rising up in our temperatures. Minus 4 is our daytime high in Winnipeg. We should be at minus 13 as a daytime high. And we are definitely not there, Janet. No, we are not. But th that's okay. It's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. You're welcome. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning British monarch in history. The, her legacy can be seen in many of Winnipeg's buildings and landmarks. We're going to look at that and show you some of those buildings after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Winnipeg has several iconic buildings that actually received a royal designation during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, let me say that again, Queen Elizabeth II. An exhibit produced by the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation titled Queen Elizabeth II and Winnipeg, A Modern Elizabethan Era, recently wrapped up at the Via Rail Station in Winnipeg. Curator Daniel Gunther spoke to CBC Manitoba about the Queen's legacy on design in our city. This exhibit here at Union Station in Winnipeg is a research project by the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation that looks at what is the modern Elizabethan era. What are the styles? What would be determined to be the style of the modern Elizabethan era of the 70 years and seven decades that the Queen was on the throne? It is a decade by decade uh, look at important projects and buildings here in the city of Winnipeg that really do define the, the growth and characteristics of each decade. So starting in the 1950s, we have you know, a very strong modernist architecture legacy. And this was a very exciting time here in Winnipeg because we have the third oldest school of architecture in Canada. So what is the modern Elizabethan era? And what we're saying is it's a very warm and welcoming reflection of both Winnipeg um, and the architecture that embodies it. You know, she came here and it was under her reign that many of our very important institutions that we remember today, such as the Manitoba Centennial Concert Hall, uh, the new Winnipeg City Hall, there's many of these institutions, even more recently, the Forks here. We have this idea of having very warm and hospitable architecture, and the Queen was obviously very fond of that because there's many, many records of her meeting with people and just being able to, to get to know who Winnipeggers are as that changed and evolved over 70 years. They may not realize that the Queen visited Winnipeg more often than most world capitals. She visited Winnipeg more than Washington DC and the White House or Paris. And so she had a very special fondness for Winnipeg. The very first royal designation by Her Majesty the Queen anywhere in the world back in 1952 was to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. And one of the very final ones that she gave was back in 2014 to Winnipeg's Aviation Museum, which is now the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada. People are sometimes surprised because we think, you know, what is Winnipeg? And we are a very humble city. And yet we don't sometimes appreciate just how fantastic our architecture is. And a lot of Winnipeggers don't know how many people travel here from around the world to look at our architecture. And so that's why it's a fantastic uh, time to look back and say in the last 70 years and the immense growth of Winnipeg, what would be the modern Elizabethan era and what represents that here in Winnipeg. And we really feel that Winnipeg's architecture does embody what the modern Elizabethan era will be remembered for. Your seven-day forecast and daily lift are still to come. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
This mild streak continues in Winnipeg. Looking for minus four tomorrow as a daytime high. A reminder, normal is minus 13. Minus three for Saturday, minus two for Sunday. We do start to cool down a little bit as we look towards next week. But the one thing that's positive about next week is we finally see some sunshine, Janet. That will be good. That and be very refreshing. Normal temperatures will be good for yeah. ice freeze up and stuff. Super great. Uh, be prepared. We've got great baby zoo news here Adorable. for you. A zoo in England is celebrating the birth of the world's rarest chimpanzee. And that is tonight's Daily Lift. He's so cute. Do you see him right there on his mummy's belly? Uh, the young male is a western chimp and they're critically endangered, a subspecies native to western Africa. Their ranks have decreased by 80% in the last 25 years. The little guy's been bonding with his mom ever since he was born last month. Now he hasn't been named yet, mm. but apparently this zoo has named other baby chimps after famous musicians. So what do you think, Fiona? Oh. Harry Styles? Oh. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm here for it. I totally stole that joke. <laughs> that is not my. He's so cute. Oh, look at his sleepy face. So cute. We have to go. I'm taking tomorrow off. Yeah. It's yeah. me and Emily. Have a great long weekend. They'll have fun. <laughs>